Friends, keep your Bibles open in Genesis 28. We should pray before we start, hey? How about we pray? Father, I ask that you might help me to speak with clarity and truthfulness to your word. And in this story today, as we see you deal graciously with your people, we ask that you might help us to love and trust the Lord Jesus evermore, even more. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Well, a hundred years ago, future British Prime Minister Winston Churchill was in London on Armistice Day, and here is his description of what he witnessed in London on that day. Then suddenly, the first stroke of the chime. I looked again at the broad street beneath me. It was deserted. Then, from all sides, men and women came scurrying into the street. Streams of people poured out from all the buildings. The bells of London began to clash. Northumberland Avenue was now crowded with people in hundreds, nay, thousands rushing hither and thither in a frantic manner, shouting and screaming with joy. I can see that Trafalgar Square was already swarming. Around me in our very headquarters, disorder had broken out. Doors banged, feet clattered down the corridors. Everyone rose from the desk. All bounds were broken. The tumult grew. It grew like a gale, but from all sides simultaneously. The street was now a seething mass of humanity. Flags appeared as if by magic. Streams of men and women flowed from the embankment. They mingled with torrents, pouring down the strand. Almost before the last stroke of the clock had died away, the strict, war-straightened, regulated streets of London had become a triumphant pandemonium. Well, it's apt that we're reading the story of Jacob's dream on Remembrance Day today, for in it, we see a similar transformation we see a pretty ordinary situation turned around by a simple message of hope. Our story starts with Jacob heading to a new country as a fugitive. But what led us to this point? Well, if you remember back in the story of Genesis to the beginning of the Jacob and Esau story, Jacob and his twin brother Esau, they struggled with one another from day dot. In the womb, at birth, and throughout all of their lives. And this struggle between the boys culminated in Esau selling his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. Do you remember that? Well, Jacob, the younger, received the birthright from his brother Esau and then proceeded to deceive Isaac, their father, to receive his blessing and inheritance. Well, Esau found out about Jacob's trickery and was furious, which then caused Jacob to run for his life. And so we get to the narrative today, and although Jacob was the one who now was supposed to have this birthright, carry the family name instead of his older brother, the reality is a little bit different. He's exiled and has no home. He's estranged from his family and he's left with nothing. And it's on Jacob's journey to Haran, which is some 900 kilometres away, where we pick up the story. Now, only a short way into Jacob's journey, he gets to a certain point at nightfall. It's a pretty ordinary place. It's rocky in the wilderness. And it's here that he bunks down for the night. But it's not just an ordinary place. It's a hostile place. Like every dark place in the ancient wilderness, there are plenty of dangers wild animals on the prowl, hostile warring nations, bandits on the road. And on top of this, Jacob also fears his brother. 
that he may also find him and kill him. Just stop to think about what Jacob was feeling that night. I gather that it wouldn't have been too dissimilar from what our diggers were feeling sitting in those trenches a hundred years ago. It's not a nice little camping trip. It's a time of conflict. There's fear. Feeling alone. Uncertainty of the future of whether tonight might be your last. Well, Jacob was there, alone in the dark, and to rub salt into the wound, the only thing there to comfort him was a stone. A cold, hard stone. Now, the language in the original Hebrew is actually ambiguous. We're not quite sure whether he put the stone under his head as a pillow or beside his head for protection. Either way, the stone is a pretty ordinary pillow and it's a pretty ordinary protection from the hostility of the night. Well, as he listened to all of the noises of the night and clung to that hard, cold stone, somehow, miraculously, he was able to fall asleep. And in his sleep, he dreamed a dream. And it's here in this dream that God shows up with a message of hope. Verse 12 of chapter 28. And he dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And Yahweh stood beside him and said, I am Yahweh the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go, And will bring you back back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Well, just like the message of ceasefire in World War I, God's message to Jacob turns the mood around. Have a look at what God says. God makes a promise to Jacob in his immediate context. Although Jacob doesn't have a home anymore, God will give him land. Although Jacob is estranged from his family, God will give him a family, offspring that shall be like the dust of the earth. Although Jacob was left without any whiff of his birthright, God will bring blessing to him and the world through him. And although Jacob feels horribly alone, God is with him. Now, these promises aren't new. They're the same promises that God made to Abraham, his grandfather, and to Isaac, his father. And God here reiterates them to Jacob. In the mess and conflict of Jacob's life, at this point in time, God is with him. When Jacob awoke, he was still afraid, verse 17... But something had changed. He had seen and heard the holy God of his fathers. And so he shouts out in praise to God. He's in awe. Surely Yahweh is in this place, this ordinary, hostile place. And I didn't even know it. He praises God and he also does something curious. That same stone that he was using as a pillow, Jacob upends into a pillar. What's going on here? Well, Jacob is actually echoing what God has just done. God has just showed up and turned a pretty ordinary situation into an extraordinary one. And likewise, Jacob turns this pretty ordinary rock into a special rock one that would stand as a testimony, a reminder of God's promise 
and God's presence. Yahweh is in this place. Now, this is so important, not just to Jacob, but for all of Genesis. Because remember the one thing that we are looking for after Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, conflict. Sin enters the world, cuts off humanity from God's promise and his presence. So, for example, that the Tower of Babel, it gets built up, reaching up to heaven to bridge the divide, bridge the gap between God and man, albeit with gross pride attached to its builders. But here, a stairway comes down from heaven and God says, I will be with you. God's promise, God's presence. Well, we need to see that this message comes to us in an even bigger context than Genesis. A biblical context. And Jesus himself tips us off to that fact. How about you turn your Bibles to John chapter 1? And we'll have a look from verse 43. Now, it's important to see what Jesus says. This isn't just what some preacher is saying. He's perfect. I'm not. John chapter 1. And we'll start from verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida the city of Andrew and Peter, Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, he said of him, Here is truly an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael asked him, Where did you get to know me? Jesus answered, I saw you under the fig tree before Philip called you. Nathanael replied, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered, Do you believe because I told you that I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Very truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. You will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. In the bigger biblical context, Jesus points all the way back to Jacob's dream. He's saying, you know God's promises to Jacob. Well, this is talking about me. If you're looking for God's presence on earth, you found him. Well, God does exactly the same thing here as he did with Jacob. Although Jesus seems like a pretty ordinary guy, what good can come from Nazareth, they said. Well, Jesus says all of God's promises, all of God's presence is here. This is no ordinary situation. And I'm no ordinary man, he says. You will see the angels of God ascending and descending upon me. Where are we going to look for restored connection between God and man? We don't have to look to things in creation, to gemstones, a walk in the bush, inwardly towards ourselves to find God. No, God's promises and God's presence has come to earth in Jesus. He is the connection, the stairway 
to God. He is the connection between God and man. Well, if we flick back to Genesis and take a closer look at Jacob's response to this dream, we realise that not all is right. Verse 20 Then Jacob made a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then Yahweh shall be my God. I wonder how many of us have made these promises to God. Conditional on how God first deals with us. God, if you do such and such, then I'll worship you. I'll devote my life to you. I'll be loyal. In one sense, this is a right response. We should recognise that what God does for us every day and respond in worship and trust. But really, it's what's left unsaid that makes this a poor response. If God isn't with me, if he doesn't give me such and such, well, then what? The implication is that I'm free to give God the flick. If hardship comes in my life, well, then why or how should I trust God? No, God is God. And because he is God, he deserves our worship and trust, no matter what life looks like. In affluence, in adversity, through times of pain, times of joy, God owns it all. He's the king of it all. And we owe our whole lives to him. Well, Jacob's response is a poor response. This schema reverts to his old ways in this manipulative kind of vow to God. But does it ruin God's plans? Does it void the promises made? Of course not. The dream has already pointed us to this very truth about God... Jacob's response, or part of it, is very ordinary. But God is the God who turns ordinary things, even hostile things, into something special. Even Jacob, this deceptive schemer who is running away to a land far away, God will bring him back and will be with him. We know this to be true in our own lives, don't we? You and I are very ordinary people. We shift and turn through the course of life. We make good, godly decisions one minute and the stupid, sinful decisions the next. Perhaps we even put conditions on God like Jacob did. But none of this hinders God's plans or purposes. As we approach God in the Lord Jesus Christ... God turns our own ordinary and sometimes hostile lives into something beautiful and pleasing to God. How does he do this? Through a simple message of peace. As we come to God through Jesus, we are no longer his enemies. At war with God, but we have peace through a costly and great sacrifice, mind you. That's for another sermon. And today of all days, this is something that we should remember. We should commemorate. We should respond with great joy and thanksgiving to God that peace has been won with God through Jesus. Well, we we just don't have time today to look further at chapter 29. We'll get there next week as we look at Rachel and Leah and Laban. But at this point in time, I need to ask you, do you have peace with God? 
in this story of Jacob and his dream, we see that God is in the business of taking very ordinary and hostile situations and turning them around. We see that God's promises ultimately find their fulfilment in Jesus, that Jesus is the very connection between God and man. He is that stairway to heaven. In Jesus, we see God's message of peace, of ceasefire. If you do not know this peace through Christ, I implore you, don't keep warring away against God. No one can come out ahead against a holy, just and powerful God. Come to Christ. Have peace with God. If you already have peace with God through Christ, we'll keep living in for Jesus. Remembering that God's promises in Christ cannot be frustrated. God takes ordinary situations, ordinary lives, yours and mine, and he uses them for his purposes all for the glory of his holy name. And that's something that we need to remember. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And we ask that you might help us to understand more fully what that means and to trust in it. To not war against you, We thank you for this uh, story of Jacob in his dream and how he so perfectly points to Jesus. And we pray that you might continue to grow our trust and love for him. We pray that you might be with Jan today. We pray that you might be healing her. And we thank you for the Ambos and pray that you might be with them as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.